everybody, this is Mr. Bortnick for AP Calculus AB. We are in Unit 1, Limits and Continuity. Today's topic is Topic 1.10, Exploring Types of Discontinuities. Enjoy today's notes. All right, we've got our notes today on Section 1.10, Exploring Types of Discontinuities. Uh, as usual, this packet should be available in our Google Classroom, and I encourage you to take notes uh, along with us and in your notebook as we go through. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, this word continuity, and we're going to give uh, what I'm going to refer to as an informal definition. So an informal definition of continuity. And what that means is it's not a great mathematical definition, uh, and we're going to get a little bit more into what uh, the actual mathematical definition of continuity is uh, in the next two lessons. Uh, but for right now, what I want you to think about when you think about continuous functions or continuity is the idea of can you draw the function? So can you draw the function without lifting up your pencil? So can you draw the function without lifting up your pencil? If we say yes, then we say that the function is continuous. If we say no, then we refer to it as not continuous, aka discontinuous. So a function is going to be either continuous or discontinuous. And we could actually talk about whether a function is continuous or discontinuous on different intervals of its domain, uh, but that's not going to be our focus for today. We're going to talk about that uh, in our next lesson. Now, what am I talking about when I'm saying, uh, is this function continuous? Well, if we look at our first function that we've got right here on the left, notice if I were to start in the bottom left and I were to move along the function as I draw this function out, going from the bottom left all the way up to the top right, notice that I can do that without lifting my pencil up. And so we've got a continuous function for this. This is a great example of a continuous function. Over here though, we might notice that first off, this, this second function over here has two parts. If I were to try to draw this function going from left to right, we notice that I would follow this curve. It appears to be going down. And then there's probably an asymptote right here that I would have to lift my pencil up and then start up at the top and then continue uh, on to finish out the function. So the fact that I had to lift up my pencil going from the left side to the right side here is a good indicator for me that this function is discontinuous. So that would be an example of a discontinuous function. First one's continuous, second one is discontinuous. Now, uh, within being continuous or discontinuous, there are different types of discontinuities. So there are different ways that a function can be discontinuous, and we have some uh, visuals of them here on the right side. The three ways that a function can be discontinuous is first off, if the function has a hole in it, we refer to it as a discontinuity. The second case that we have is a vertical asymptote. And the third type of, of discontinuity is what we refer to as a skip or a jump. And we're going to talk about each of these with these uh, pictures here on the side. So first off, uh, if we're looking at our, if we're looking at our first uh, one, that's going to be this first uh, graph that we've got right here. And what we notice uh, when we're referring to the whole or is going to be this thing that's right here. Now this has a little bit of a more formal name uh, within it just being a discontinuity. We sometimes uh, categorize these with whether the function is either a removable discontinuity or a non-removable discontinuity. I would refer to uh, this particular one as a removable discontinuity. All ho holes are removable discontinuities because uh, essentially it's like we've re removed one point from the graph, right? We've removed that one point from the graph. And in fact, if I were just to fill this in, the function would be, would be good to go. It'd be ready. It would be a full continuous function. Uh, but since that function is not uh, filled in, we've essentially removed part of it. It is a removable discontinuity. And that's the reason why uh, it is discontinuous. 
If we take a look at our second type of discontinuity, uh, vertical asymptotes, that's going to be this graph over here. Notice, I mean, clearly in this case, we can see that it's got this vertical asymptote uh, in that case, and that's causing uh, the graph to have two different parts, right? And I cannot, if we go back to our idea of this informal definition of continuity, can I draw this without lifting up my pencil? No, I can't, because there's this vertical asymptote in the way, and that sort of gives me these like two different parts of the graph that are separated here. So uh, that is going to cause us to be uh, to have a discontinuity. Now, is this removable? No, because I can't just fill in one point uh, to make this a continuous function. And so because of this, this has a, this is a, an example of a non-removable discontinuity. That's an example of a non-removable discontinuity. Our third one that we're gonna talk about here is the skip and jump. And that's this third graph that we've got right here. Um, we essentially are looking at the two parts for this. We're seeing that it's going from one part and then it's jumping up to this other part. There's like a jump. It's separated these two parts. So it's discontinuous and then it continues on after that. Uh, similarly, uh, we might notice that again, I can't fill in just like one dot here to make this continuous. And so because of this, this is another example of a non-removable discontinuity. So really our only type of removable discontinuity is going to be uh, a hole. And vertical asymptotes and skip jumps are examples of non-removable discontinuities. Now in today's notes, we are going to focus mainly on these first two, uh, holes and vertical asymptotes. Uh, this third one we're going to focus on mostly in the 1.11 lesson, so that's our next lesson. Uh, but all of the examples we're going to see going on are going to be examples of holes or vertical asymptotes. And we're going to talk about really how we can tell which is which. Now, let's move on to the examples. Number one. Uh, for each function, identify the type of each discontinuity and where it is located. Uh, so we have x squared minus 8x plus 12 divided by x squared plus 3x minus 10. In this case, you know, I, I really can't just look at this equation as it is and determine what the discontinuity is. This is going to be another case where it is extremely to your advantage to factor these equations as much as uh, you can. And so let's talk about this. If I were to do my x method, right, in that numerator, we might see that the numerator would factor out to x plus 6 times x minus 2. So x plus 6 times x minus 2 would be our factor for that. And in the denominator, if we do x squared plus 3x minus 10, we might notice that this is going to uh, factor out to x plus 5 times x minus 2. Now, what creates a, a discontinuity? What creates uh, this hole or this vertical asymptote that we see here? And the thing that, that does this, uh, and, and a lot of these problems you're going to notice, uh, have to do with, with the denominator, right? We know that in any fraction, right, in any fraction, we know that we cannot divide by zero. You cannot divide by zero. That is sort of the key indicator uh, for thinking about what's going to cause a discontinuity. So anytime the denominator is zero, we're going to have something weird going on in the graph. It might be a vertical asymptote, it might be a hole, we might have a, a step or a jump, um, but it, you know, those are the, those are the cases that, that's going to create in a graph of this. And so the, how do we determine from this factored form which one it is? Um, there's a nice set of rules for this. Once we have uh, our factors, what we can notice is I can notice in the denominator these two factored equations. So the first is x plus 5, and I know that it cannot equal 0, right? If, it were, if that were to equal 0, that's going to make the whole denominator equal to 0. And so what x value is that? Well, we subtract 5 from both sides, and we see that x cannot be equal to negative 5, right? So that is uh, our first discontinuity, our first point of discontinuity if we were to graph this function. We also know that, that x minus 2, that other factor, cannot be equal to 0. And so if we add that 2 to the other side, we see that x cannot be equal to 2. 
So I've now identified where the discontinuities are going to occur. Now we need to categorize them, right? They're asking us which, uh, what type of discontinuity uh, do we have? And here's the general rule for this. The rule is if the uh, factor, for example, this x minus 2, can cancel with a factor in the numerator, if they cancel, like we see that they would right here, then that's going to give us a whole. And so I know that that x is not equal to 2 is going to be a whole on the graph because that x minus 2 factor canceled with one that was in the numerator. This x plus 5, though, has nothing to cancel out with in the numerator, right? There's no exact x plus 5 in that numerator. So because of that, when we graph this function, it's going to create a vertical asymptote at x is, uh, x is equal to negative 5. Um, and so just a recap of that, again, if factors cancel, then we say it's a whole. If factors do not cancel, we are going to say it is a vertical asymptote. I'm going to say VA, vertical asymptote, for that. So that's sort of our key piece of how you determine which is which. And factoring is a huge piece to this because we can, once we factor, we can determine whether or not those uh, factors cancel out or not. And that's going to let us know whether it's a whole or a vertical asymptote. Let's move on to number two. G of x is equal to x plus 1 divided by x to the fourth minus 1. Uh, that numerator, I cannot cancel that out. There's nothing to factor here. And so I'm going to look at my denominator, and I might notice that this is actually a difference of two squares. Um, if we remember our difference of two squares, um, that's the rule that says that a squared minus b squared is equal to a plus b times a minus b. In this case, what's our a and our b? Well, you know, we could factor this into being that x plus 1 up in the numerator. This is going to be x squared plus 1 times x squared minus 1, that difference of two squareds. And what we also notice is that when I do that, I actually have another uh, difference of two squareds right here, x squared minus 1. And so I'm going to factor this a little bit further. Uh, let's see, let's erase that. Uh, let's factor this a little bit further. In that case, that numerator is still x plus 1. And that this uh, x squared plus 1 is going to stay there because it's not a difference of two squares. That's a sum of two squares. But that x squared minus 1 is going to become uh, x plus 1 times x minus 1 if we use, again, this difference of uh, two squares uh, rule that's there. Now, this is actually as factored as this is going to get. I can't go any further. Um, but let's take a look at this denominator again. Right? Our denominator here, we're looking for things that are going to make the denominator equal to 0. And so we might notice, first off, that uh, we know that that x plus 1 cannot equal 0. And we know that x minus 1 cannot equal 0. So I know that x cannot equal negative 1. And I know that x cannot equal positive 1. Because if they do, then we're going to have a, disc a discontinuity. So those are places where there are going to be discontinuities at x equals 1 and x equals negative 1. Um, if we think about this one over here, I actually cannot get that equal to 0. Right? If we do x squared plus 1 uh, equals 0, we're going to get x squared equals negative 1. And then we get into uh, imaginary number territory. Right? I'm thinking back last year about i's uh, and things like that. But there are no real answers for this. And so I'm going to leave this one aside. That one is going to not... Uh, be allowed to equal to zero. Um, so then what do we notice? Well, I notice uh, looking back at our equation that this factor of x plus 1 is going to cancel with this factor of x plus 1 in the numerator. That tells me that there's going to be a whole at x equals negative 1. And this x minus 1 here has nothing to cancel out with the numerator, so there's going to be a vertical asymptote at x equals positive 1. And we can graph it and we can check uh, to see if that's actually the case. Uh, and that actually is going to be the case if we do that for number two. Number three, we're getting a little bit into trig land here. Um, this one, you know, requires a little bit of background knowledge in terms of what tangent is. A general thing that's useful to know is that tan of x is defined as 
sine of x divided by cosine of x. This is a nice little uh, trick of trigonometry that, that comes in useful. Um, and in order to do this problem, we're gonna, we're gonna think about it because uh, if I look at the, the problem as it's written, right, h of x is equal to tan of 2x, notice that these other problems that we had that we did, they were all about making the denominator equal to zero, right? But number three, we don't have any denominator as this is written. And so this is a suggestion for me to say, okay, well, let's, let's take that h of x and let's actually rewrite this as sine of 2x over cosine of 2x. And that's just using uh, our uh, rule that we've got over here. This tan of x is equal to sine of x over cosine of x. Since there is a 2x inside of the tan, we put that inside of both the sine and the cosine uh, to keep that the same expression. And what we've got here then is now we're thinking about what's gonna make the denominator equal to zero. How do we, we know that cosine of 2x cannot equal zero. Um, and so we're thinking about, uh, you know, a little bit of trigonometry and, you know, depending upon how comfortable you are with the unit circle uh, or with taking a look at the graph of cosine, we might know that uh, cosine, uh, cosine of x in general, equals zero uh, on the unit circle when x is equal to uh, pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2. Those are two places where uh, cosine of x is equal to 0. And so what does that tell me? That tells me, well, that the inside of this function, this two, uh, two x, is going to need to equal that pi over 2 or that 3 pi over 2. And so some values that we've got, well, we're going to say, okay, 2x is equal to pi over 2 and uh, also 2x is equal to 3 pi over 2. This is going to help me solve for x and figure out what x values those need to be. If we divide by 2 on both sides, we're going to get that x is equal to pi over 4, or that x is equal to 3 pi, 3 pi over 4. Now, uh, these are two answers that we've got where there's going to be discontinuities. Uh, in addition, there are actually two others. Uh, because this is saying from 0 to 2 pi, we've actually only found two of the possible answers. Uh, we could also have 2x is equal to 5 pi over 2, or 2x is equal to 7 pi over 2. Now this is, again, coming from unit circle knowledge. Uh, if we divide by 2 here, we've got x is equal to 5 pi over 4, or uh, x is equal to, what's that, 7 pi over 4. So all of these uh, are cases where the function tan of 2x is going to have uh, actually a vertical asymptote because there's nothing for those cosines to cancel with in the numerator. Um, what I will say is if you're feeling a little uncomfortable right now in terms of tan and working with these trig functions, I will be posting a video soon where I go through uh, some unit circle tips and tricks. Uh, and really just sort of review some important things about trigonometry that we need to know going into this year. That's number three. Last one, number four. Uh, notice in this case, this has no denominator. X squared minus one. There's no way for me to re rewrite this that has any other denominator other than one. And so there's no way for the denominator to equal zero. Uh, and so for me, this is making me immediately sort of think, hey, this is a continuous function. It's gonna be a continuous function. And if we think about what this is, we, we know x squared is going to give us the graph of a parabola, and we know that minus 1 is going to just shift that parabola down. If we think about uh, our graph of this function, we can see that the graph for this function is simply going to be, uh, let's erase that, is simply going to be down at negative 1, this parabola essentially opening upward. And if we think about parabolas, just basic parabolas that we have, uh, we would notice that, you know, there are no holes, there's no vertical asymptotes. And so that's a good graphical way to support the fact that this is a continuous function. In fact, uh, you know, all just general polynomial functions without denominators, we often refer to them as what's called well-behaved. They're well-behaved functions. There's nothing really crazy going on about them. There's no holes or there's no uh, vertical asymptotes. There's no steps. There's no jumps. Uh, generally, polynomial functions with no denominator 
are in that well-behaved category. And there are other well-behaved category uh, functions as well, which we'll get into uh, more in our following videos. Uh, but for right now, that's going to be it for today's notes. Uh, work on the practice that we've got here and fill out your 1.10 mastery check. Have a great rest of your day.